Welcome to One Insight. My name is Rich Litvin. I grew up in London and I now live in LA. And this is a podcast for extraordinary top performers and their coaches. You see, I've coached some of the most successful and talented people on the planet. I can see what most people cannot see. And I dare to say what most people wouldn't dare to say. And what I know about success is that on the other side of it, it can be incredibly lonely. You can feel more of an imposter the more successful you become. And when you're the most interesting person in the room, you're actually in the wrong room. Clients who are more successful, more intelligent and wealthier than you need your support more than they know and more than you can imagine. I coach around insight. Life looks one way, something happens and the world looks different and your entire world changes. It can happen in an instant. And this podcast is called One Insight because a single insight can change everything. Hey y'all, this is episode number 102. And this week I am honored to bring you a conversation that I had with my former coach and now friend, Rich Lippin. I found Rich Lippin, I think in 2013, I had really been doing some hardcore structure work and systems work, and I found him online, found his book, The Prosperous Coach, and it just brought back relationships. Uh, to my coaching practice. And it was exactly what I needed at just the right time. And I dove into working with Rich, learning from Rich to his communities. And I wanted to share him with you as what I call part of the ancestry of my business um, and who I am as a coach and as a leader. And there are so many threads that make up the quilt of the woman that I am today. And Rich Levin is somebody that has a very strong thread running through my quilt. And so I wanted to share a conversation um, that I had with him with you. I notice I feel, um, I'm thinking about myself, not about you or not about Rich, but I was so tired during this and um, I didn't feel like the best interviewer, but you know what? Rich was the best guest. And so um, in this episode, you're going to hear some about his teachings. I He talks about his proprietary um, program called MSU, Snicker Snicker. And um, I'm just grateful for him in my life. And I'm grateful to share some of his love and his wisdom with you. Uh, let me know what you think. And... Without further ado, here is episode number 102, Meet One of My Mentors, Rich Lippin. We're, as we're recording this, it is in the context, it's June 1st, and so um, it's, in a, it's not in a context of something new going on. The inflammation and awareness is heightened right now of the reality of what it's like to be Black in America. And so I wanted to ask you, because I know you're uh, raising two sons and you're married to a woman who has been a part of my journey about white privilege and learning. Um, so I wanted to ask how you are doing in that context. Yeah. So hi, Alison. Hi, Rich. Interesting times we're meeting in. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm British. I'm white. I'm Jewish. Grew up in England. I'm a citizen of the United States these days. I've been here about 14 years. And my wife from almost those last 14 years, is a woman of color. She's mixed. Her dad's African-American, grew up in North Carolina, and it's hard for me to get my head around it. He grew up during segregation. I thought that was something that happened in the history books. Oops. Um, I thought it was something happened in the history books, but it happened in, in, in his lifetime. Um, her mom is Irish-American, grew up in upstate New York. And so when they met, there's this tall white lady with red hair married to an African-American man with dark skin. They met in the Peace Corps um, in the early 70s and they've been together ever since. And so uh, I, married to a woman of color, I, I get to hear, you know, behind the scenes in, in, in conversations that uh, many people who are, are white don't get to, to be privy to. Uh, you know, I've got married to a woman who is a singer-songwriter. Her third album just got released and it debuted at number two on the jazz charts. 
She created a one-woman show that won awards. But Monique knows if she walks into certain stores, she gets followed around a store in a way that never happens to me. Mm -hmm. Her father's a professor at a university. He's won awards for his teaching. He's been on uh, uh, committees for the LAPD and all sorts of other things, uh, managed a a million-dollar grant to make a difference uh, for juveniles who are trying to reduce recidivism among kids who've been convicted of a crime. And yet, as a black man, when he goes out into the world, the world uh, sees him in a certain way and none of his resume means anything. Mm -hmm. In a way that doesn't happen for me. when we started homeschooling 10 weeks ago, I've got a background as an educator. I'm a teacher by background. And Monique and I have couples counseling and our counselor happens to be a woman of color. And we were chatting to her on a Zoom call <laughs> as everything's done on a Zoom. Mm-hmm. And Monique was sharing her frustration that the kids didn't want to do the English assignments the way they're supposed to be done and the math assignments and so on. And I was much more relaxed. It's like, you know, actually, if you have fun with the kids, they'll learn more and what our counselor pointed out is what I can't see is that a woman of color raising young kids that she has an awareness of barriers they need to pass through that I don't even have to think about. Mm -hmm. And that part of the reason maybe behind Monique, even unconsciously wanting to make sure they understand the math and the English is that she wants them to be ready for what's coming in society. And I think what's happened in the last few days, very viscerally we're seeing it is that many white people are having access to a conversation that they, they don't always get access to. Um, going all the way back to the 60s in this country, the United States, people have um, been impacted hugely because of their color through uh, the, uh, their access to jobs, uh, their, their, their access to possibilities, uh, the way that the police... Uh, some police officers may treat them. Of course, you know, this is a legacy of hundreds of years of being a country where most people of color originally were here through no choice of their own. Mm-hmm. They were enslaved. So it's a really complex conversation that many white friends of mine, for the first time, are realizing I thought that everything was okay. We had a black president that prejudice has been going down over the years and suddenly in a real visceral way we're seeing it may not be the way we, we thought it was that, that mm. things that we take for granted aren't there for all people in, in society so I'm making it sound like I'm really articulate about this I, I, it, two days ago I got a, a text message from our friend Varian uh. and Varian said so Varian's a woman of color and she said Rich you are one of the most powerful leaders I know and I noticed you haven't been speaking out that was happening right now and she said, actually, I'm not attached. If it's not your thing, I'm not calling you out to do this. I'm just curious why, why you're not. And does that mean anything? And, and I realized I, I've been afraid, Alison. Uh, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I'm Jewish. And in the last five years, four, four years, really, in this country, there have been people, Jewish people have been murdered in synagogues, in their homes, they've been attacked. Uh, cemeteries have been desecrated. Uh, and Neo-Nazis have been marching in, again in this country. And I've been afraid to even talk about being Jewish. But I have the luxury of that. If I don't talk about it, everyone knows I'm Jewish. Mm-hmm. And then I'm very aware as we've watched uh, people of color be, be killed by, by police officers, let alone other situations that I have... Uh, young boys who are mixed, a wife who's a woman of color. Uh, and, and I've been afraid to speak about this. I've been afraid to talk about it. I, I, I sometimes tell myself, well, you know, I have a job as a coach where I'm making a difference in my own way. So I'll, let me do my thing. Uh, I sometimes think, uh, is, is it my place? Who am I? What am I going to say? And even the last two days, since I got the message from Barry and I've been wondering, what am I going to add to this conversation? I'm watching lots of white people in a very articulate way share how impacted by what's happening they are in a far more articulate way than I could manage. And I'm thinking, well, why don't it just be more noise? And I've realized, I've been writing this piece since this morning, that I can just share my experience. Mm-hmm. I can just share my fears and my doubts and my insecurities. I, I bought a book five years ago when it was first published by Tanahisi Coates. It's his book that's really a letter to his son. Tanahisi Coates is a black man in America. He's written a letter to his son about what it means to be a young black boy growing up in the United States. And for five years, it has sat on my nightstand and I've been too afraid to read it because it's, what it's really about is something that 
if you're a black parent, you know, it's called the conversation. And the conversation is that moment you have to sit down with your black son and you have to tell him about <laughs> however you're raising him, that the world out there may not meet uh, him the way and see him and treat him the way that you have raised him as a family. And, and as, a, as a white father, I've been afraid to have that conversation. I have an eight-year-old son right now and I'm, I'm afraid to this moment to have that conversation, to start speaking about that. So that's the complexity of the world that I live in right now. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for acknowledging your fear as it, you know, you have your life and your own self-leadership and your family leadership and raising your sons. And then you have this business that came up on our coaching call today. We were talking about self-leadership and, and, and even f- facing our own fears so that we can be a converse, part of the conversation of what's happening in the context of our culture. And you can't wait for one to be done to step into the culture conversation. We have to sometimes take these risks to get it wrong. And so I just appreciate you acknowledging um, your fear. And, you know, just as a human being, when we have business, that's one of our layers of security. (laughs) And I don't think anybody wants to wake up and, well, I know that a lot of people have been afraid to say something or to not say something or to say the wrong thing. And, um, yeah. I, th- so I think, yeah. I think a lot of people who are white are very afraid of saying the wrong thing. They're not sure what to say, what language to use. And if the nuance is slightly inappropriate, it's easier to say nothing. Um, and I know I've been caught in that and, and, uh, it's, it's complicated. I, I started the article I'm writing right now. I started to explain about the various friends I have who are people of color from my two closest buddies in England to friends in this country. And I realized you, I can't do that. <laughs> it's like saying my best friends are black. Right. There's a truth in it, which isn't true for other people. So it's complicated. Do, do I mention this, which gives some, uh, fleshes out some of my experience and who I am or, or, Am I trying to justify myself and make myself sound like I'm a certain kind of person? It, it, it's a complicated situation. <clears throat> we live in uh, some interesting times right now. Yeah, it's very nuanced. Thanks for sharing your heart with me. Um, before before we started, your youngest son, Ellington, came in and it reminded me of um, how long I've known you. And I actually looked that up before mm-hmm. we started talking. It was April of 2013. Um, I found this book called The Prosperous Coach. I think I saw somebody share it on social media. And I started reading it. Um, and I sent you a message and I said, fuck you. <laughs> and I think, I, I mean, obviously I knew from reading that you would get it. That You've you been would. sending me that same message on a regular basis ever since. <laughs> well, you and I both know that when somebody sends you the right kind of fuck you, it's you, you've hit the right nerve. Um, and the reason I asked you to come and talk with me today, um, was I've been thinking a lot about what Hero Boga calls as the lineage of her business. She has a book called The um, World of Your Business Playbook. And it's about how to create a world of welcome and belonging for you and your customers. And it's a really, really, really deep dive in both essence and structure of creating your company. I got it a couple of years ago and I just brought it back out. And I noticed that in every single coaching session I have, I learned this from Rich Litman. I learned this from Rich Litman. And I'm a cider and a sourcer. I, I give source when I remember where I learned it from. And I cite you almost every single time. And then um, someone asked me the other day, they're like, you still talk to Rich Lipman? <laughs> and I said, yeah, we're more colleagues now. You know, um, I, so you wrote, co-wrote the book, The Prosperous Coach. I went to years of Prosperous Coach intensives. Um, I was in your um, inaugural class of 4PC. You asked me to come back the second year. And I told you, I love you. I want to come back. But if I come back, I won't create what I hired you to help me create. And so I stepped away to go create my own thing. And you are woven a very thick thread through my business. Um, And I just wanted to honor and appreciate you and hear what's up in your world today and what you're teaching about. And um, 
I also remember there was a time when I wanted to specifically talk to you about how sales could be fun. And I don't know that that's where we have to go today, but you certainly had an impact on teaching me to use communication in sales in a way that was very different from what I learned in real estate. Yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah, you take me back. I, I don't consider us colleagues. I consider us friends these days. Yes. Um, uh, I never forgot because I talk about you and I tell, when I tell this story and I tell it a lot. I, I had an idea in, well, it must have been seven years ago, whatever that date was, that I was going to create a community of really extraordinary coaches and I'd call it 4PC. And 4PC stood for 4%, which is the top 20% of the top 20%. People who play an interesting game, people who think differently. And I went to this event, I was running an intensive and I had it all planned out in my mind. And I sat on the stage and my young, my oldest son, Kaleo, had, had, was only a year or two old. And he, he came out, Monique brought him in, he sat on my lap and I started sharing about this. And I started to explain this amazing community I was creating and what it was about, except I got all tongue tied. I broke out in a sweat. I got confused. I didn't know what to say. And I, Thought it was because, oh, I should have the wrong time to put Kaleo on my lap. And I said, let's call a break. I'll come back in 10 minutes and we'll chat again. And it was in the break I realized, oh no, it was nothing to do with Kaleo sitting on my lap. It was, this is the first time I've ever spoken this dream out loud. And sometimes when you speak a dream out loud for the first time, it doesn't sound so good and, and, and it comes out as it did up here in your head. Usually when you speak it the first time, it comes out weird. <laughs> exactly. And so I, I owned that and I, I said, I'm embarrassed. I wish it sounded better. Um, I, I wish I was clearer and I could articulate it better. And a voice at the back of the room said, I'm in. And it was you. Alison put her hand up and said, Rich, I'm in. I don't even know what you're talking about or what this is, but I trust you. And if you're taking a group of people on an interesting journey together for a year, I'm in. And I've never forgotten that. I, I tell that story all the time. And, and I tell it from a place of uh, gratitude to you because uh, the moment the first person's in, it always feels real to me, whatever I'm creating. And 4BC became real the moment you said, I'm in. And it's now been running mm -hmm. for six years. We've had extraordinary coaches coming through it, still in it. Um, and so I credit you uh, with the birth of 4BC. And at the same time, I think it's a really interesting way to think about how do you sell something? We want to be perfect. We want to have the logo just right. The color palette is beautiful. The sales copy is perfect. But I've learned over the years... Uh, oh, I don't know if you read this. I wrote an article about this recently. I've got a proprietary process for creating new programs. And I use okay. an acronym. It's MSU. Okay. It stands for Make Shit Up. <laughs> He's going to create a class called Throw Shit at the Wall and like sell a class on it. Yeah. yeah, well, yeah you know what? Make shit up. MSU. <laughs> that's all we're ever doing. And that's all anybody's ever doing. But we, what the trouble is, we compare our shit over here with theirs and we think, oh, there must be a plan because there's seven steps to that. Or there's a three step process over there. They're going to take you through if I join their year long program. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, they made it up a week before or a year earlier. And, and so make stuff up. But really, that's all I've ever done. And, and I'm constantly making stuff up. And, and some of it goes somewhere and some of it doesn't. I, I was talking to Steve Chandler the other day, Alison. Steve got in touch and said, I'm about to retire, Rich. And would you come and speak to my community before I retire? I'm not going to be coaching any longer. So said, I'd love to. He just turned 75. I said, will you come and speak to my community um, before you retire as well? So he just came and spoke to 4PC. And we were talking about this idea of making stuff up. He said he ran a program once called... I forget something like this, the nothing course. He said he was working in a, in a Fortune 50 company and they'd done three different courses with him. And the leadership team said, just take us through another course. And he said, I didn't know what to do. He said, I've, I've done, I've taken through every course I had. I had like four courses and they'd done them all. He said, okay, I'll take you through another course. This is the course. It's called the nothing course. And the CEO said, what do you mean? He said, well, it's called the nothing course because there's no agenda here. The agenda is in your leaders come along and they tell me, what are their dreams? What are their fears? What are their doubts? What are their insecurities? And I work with them for the 12 months and what they bring. It's called the nothing course. And the CEO went, that's amazing. We're in. We'll hire you. We're always making stuff up. Well, you've always modeled that. And when I think about of all the lessons I've learned from you, be you was where, and in your world and in your communities is where I really had a chance to practice that. You never once filtered me even if I made you incredibly uncomfortable by being emotional and long-winded. 
Um, and so because I trusted you, I learned to trust me. And what's interesting is that's the principle actually of coaching, even though I'm uncertified. There, there's a certification I want to create called the uncertified coach. Um, I trusted you, but I also trust me. And to me, that is the primo coaching relationship. It's the primo marriage relationship. And from what I understand, the number one principle in coaching is the client is resourceful and whole. And so we don't have to teach at them. I think you and I are both a little bit of teachers also. You have a background as a teacher. I have a background as a teacher. But I've learned that um, the make shit up, the throw spaghetti at the wall, or I think you used to always say the content's in the room. Mm. Um, the content is in, in all those questions you just asked with our people. And we can't go wrong when you know um, they're the hero instead of us being the hero. And you gave me, I never really thought about it this way, um, Miller Brand, I can't remember all of his name, uh, but he... Yeah, t- Story Brand. Yes, but he talks about the client being the hero. And I remember reading that, and that is one of the things you let me be. And in my world previous to you, I'm thankful to those ancestors too, but for different reasons, they taught me mostly what I don't want to be, some of what I appreciate. But you taught me how to let my clients be hero by allowing me to be my own hero. In those years I was working with you, the work that I was doing with you in my business and my marriage is so foundational to who I am today and my relaxed nature, my ability to trust myself, uh, my ability to both plan and wing it. Um, I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for that because it takes... <sighs> It takes, um, it, it takes, you got to drop your protective self and your ego to let your clients be the hero. Mm-hmm. Yep. You do. And you do, you do a great job at that. Please create that course called the Uncertified Coach. It's really needed. I got on a call uh, for the ICF recently and I do what I do. I teach by coaching and I, coached and then took Q&A afterwards and someone said, Rich, you asked why questions, but we're not supposed to ask why questions. And someone else said, Rich, well, you were leading the client at one point and we're not supposed to lead the client. And in as gentle way as I could on an ICF call, I said, well, look, I'm not an ICF certified coach. Like you, I don't have a certification. However, I've never stopped learning and training. I'm constantly mm-hmm. doing more and more courses and, and, and working with other coaches, being, being trained myself. Um, I said, I don't, those, those for me are like the training wheels of my kids' bikes. And uh, as a coach, we have all sorts of tools in our toolkit. We can pull them out when we need them. And some of them we let go, we don't use any longer. And, and so uh, there really is a place for the uncertified coach. I love it. So that brings me to ask this question. That's an example of you being you. But how has building this business and this practice and these communities helped you become more you? Who are you to who are you today that you weren't in April 2013 when I met you? I realize that's two questions. I don't know if you saw this. I found a video. I put it up on I think on Facebook and on my newsletter. Um, when I met Monique, she wanted to uh, do something called the um, Amazing Race, <laughs> and I thought it was horrific. The idea of of us as a couple traveling around the world uh, in some kind of competition on TV was horrific to me, but. Uh, she was my wife and I thought I'd placate her. And so I sat on a couch next to her. She held her iPhone up and recorded the two of us. And I'm there, monosyllabic, barely saying a word, totally uncomfortable in my own skin, uh, pretending I'm a little bit confident, but you can see through that immediately. I'm trying to pretend I'm not saying much because I've got it together, but I'm, I'm <laughs> mortified being on camera. I just don't want to be there. Um, uh, you know what? In, in all those years, that go- so that goes back to 2007, I'd say. When I started coaching, I started coaching people around confidence because I figured I'd lacked it for so much of my life. And I spent two years literally traveling around the world interviewing what I called the world's most confident people. And I learned a lot about confidence, but I learned a lot more about myself. I learned that confidence is feeling comfortable in your own skin. So that ability to have conversations like we did at the start here where I don't know the answer, I'm not I don't know uh, uh, where to go. I'm, I'm, I feel confused. I don't feel confident. You, you, the moment I can own that I don't feel confident, counterintuitively, makes me relax and feel more confident. 
And so that's the journey I've been on for the last, uh, well, my entire life, really. The journey into a, a relaxed kind of confidence. The kind of confidence doesn't come from me trying to prove myself or look good. Mm-hmm. The human part of me is still there. He sometimes sh- shows up. Um, I sometimes laugh, you know, who else but this guy has been trying to prove himself his whole life would create a community called 4PC, the 4% Club. Well, of course, that guy would create that. But then on the other hand, I look from this side and I say, well, nobody else did. And and this is a community of amazing people who don't have a safe space to be a really high performer and and be free to talk about the challenges that you face on the other side of success, as well as the joys of success. And so, you know, I see where that comes from. And also, I can't apologize for it any longer. That's who I am. So that's the journey I've been on, this journey into being myself more and more. In fact, I got off a call just before this call. Uh, we had, A year and a half ago, we had a new member of my team. She came on to support Wendy, who you know. Yeah. And for the first time, Wendy had her support person. And her, uh, her name's Britt. Britt just came to our intensive. We just did a 21 day virtual intensive because we couldn't do one live. And Wendy texted me about four days ago and said, Britt was there. She was there supporting me for those whole, whole, the whole time. And Britt called her up and said, Wendy, I'm really sorry. I'm going to be leaving the living group. I'm going to be leaving, leaving the company. And she said, I'm leaving because being in that intensive has inspired me to go out on my own to do the things that I'm meant to be doing in life. And we just did a celebration call with Britt. And we wow. all said how sad we are that she's leaving after a year and a half. But I just said, I'm really thrilled at the same time. I'm really thrilled because she feels confident enough to go out into the world and do what she's meant to do. And that's what I was saying to my team. We should be proud of this. We, we can't help this as a team. Wherever we go, doesn't matter whether people come to read our books, the newsletter, uh, come to an intensive or join the team, they step into their power more and more. And that's all I, it turns out all I ever do. This, this guy who spent most of his life feeling powerless really knows how to help others step into their power. And doesn't that help you feel powerful too? Like a, a, it's like a, to me, I call it soul power. Like it's, it's not shaded by my protective self, but it is my, that is my power to help other people outgrow me. Yeah. I yeah. tell my but, clients, my job is to put myself out of business. So that's really interesting. You touch on something that's, that's actually one of the hardest things for me. Uh, I, I have a belief the job of a leader is to create more leaders, not more followers. Mm-hmm. Most leaders don't play that game. They're looking for followers. And it's a really challenging game. We just ran this intensive and I did something, we called them brilliance sessions. And the members of 4PC ran brilliance sessions. They shared their magic with my community. I did this four or five years ago when you were in 4PC. We called them 10 by 10s. We had members of 4PC do 10-minute talks to share their magic with our wider community. And it's really edgy. It hasn't stopped being edgy. Because as they're happening, I'm telling myself, well then my community are going to follow this amazing person or that amazing person. Why would they be interested in me? And and the human part of me is very present when I see I'm in awe of members of my community. And and the leader in me says, well, that's my job. That's my job is to help them fly and surpass me. Yeah, I, I, I think about that. And you actively did that in my life. You let me get naked on your stage. Um, that video is on the homepage of my website. It's pinned to the top. Um, if you're listening and you don't know what she's talking about, that's not a metaphor. Alison literally took us clothes off. <laughs> I often way. think like there's now there's a whole nother section, another probably eight minutes to that story because the woman who had to have her hair painted and still wasn't, uh, you know, I'm even more today me than I was then. Um, and it is that self-trust. And and speaking of lineage and Steve Chandler, I remember being at my first intensive and I was drawing for you guys. And I said something about wanting to trust and the whole room went, test it, don't trust it. And I so get that now. Um, it's kind of like make shit up. I talk with my clients about everything is the scientific method. Everything is an experiment. And you have a hypothesis you gather your materials, you go out and do the experiment, and then you assess it, and then you do it again <laughs> with the adjustments. Um, so by the way, you've got those two words mixed up for a second. They come from the same root, experiment and experience. Hmm. And we want, we want to have the results without going through the experience. Mm-hmm. An experiment is what helps you get there. Trying stuff up, making stuff up. Um, experimenting is at some point you look back and you've been through those experiences. And, and so this, that idea I joked about my, my proprietary process for creating yeah. 
uh, uh, great success <laughs> and lots of money makes make shit up. I wrote an article recently where I went through dozens and dozens of things I've created in the last 15 years as a coach. Some of them have made lots of money. Some of them, like the Prosperous Coach, who wrote a book seven years ago that still sells a thousand copies a month to this day. Some of them were programs that never went anywhere, that no one's ever heard of. Two or three years ago, I needed some money, Alison. So I said to my team, what if I did something differently? I've been known as the guy who does deep, slow, intense coaching. But what if I wasn't? What if I just turned that on its head? You see, the, the challenge with BU is that there's also a place where you can use it to trap yourself. Or, oh no, that's not me. I, I, mm-hmm. I don't do that kind of thing. Yeah. So I like to reinvent myself, experiment, and I, I play with this idea of I called this program uh, the Fast and the Furious. The <laughs> uh, I took a photo of the Rock, a still from the movie, and superimposed my face on his body, and I created this whole program called uh, the Fast and the Furious. And we had a graphic designer who designed it all, made it, it was all ready to go, and something inside of me said it well, didn't feel right. And I pulled it, spent a lot of time and money creating this whole idea. And it, and it upset the person on my team who spent all the energy putting that together. I, I wasn't upset. I'm always experimenting. This was an experiment. It turned out in that moment wasn't to go anywhere. But when I look back two years later, I realized, oh, it became something else. It became another program I call Project Kairos. I do a lot more spot coaching these days where I'm doing real tight, focused, two minutes of coaching and I'm working mm-hmm. with somebody else and somebody else. And that came from this idea that went nowhere and made no money. I'm constantly making stuff up like this. People see my successes and want to compare themselves with them. What they don't see is all the challenges, all the mistakes, all the things that didn't work out, all the disasters I've had. Yeah. All the experimenting and experiments that go on behind the scenes. Um, Let me take a breath. I have 15 thoughts and I want to hear which one... Um, BU. So there's the BU part. And your, I think your way of talking about this, one of your ways was the perfect system. You used to teach about the perfect system. So the perfect system is a concept. Let me go, in back, the, let me go back a fraction before yeah. that because I think there's a metaphor okay. from Michael Neal that actually underlies that before you talk about that as a tool. Okay. We're born as a beautiful diamond. Mm-hmm. You see a little newborn baby, everybody just gushes over it because there's nothing on it. It's just pure presence, pure beauty. I'm, I'm sure the same with newborn puppies. You have puppies, right? Um, they're, they're just, they're just pure beauty. And then what happens as a, as a youngster, you start to take on the beliefs and the stories of your parents, of your school system, of the culture, of the country. And you take on these beliefs about how life is. Mm-hmm. And you spend the next 20 years of your life, maybe the rest of your life, this beautiful diamond gets covered in crap literally gets covered in crap. And then we spend our life trying to paint the crap with nail polish. Yep. So it looks nice and smells nice. And actually our job is not to keep doing that more layers of nail polish, just to strip away all the crap because inside all of us is that beautiful diamond. Mm-hmm. That's what underlies everything that I do and I teach about because whoever you are, I see you. I know there's a beautiful diamond in there. That's who I'm talking to. We, um, one of the themes that's been going through my business and my work, it was the theme of my live event last year is becoming. Um, because I realized, you know, there were things I wanted to do in coaching. I coach people on this stuff all the time, but if I was in my BU now brain and not in who I'm becoming brain, I wouldn't be able to create it. Mm. And so, and I guess in that context, uh, it's a, I think the diamond is clear and clean, <laughs> but I have a whole nother layer to undo. Um, and you often start coaching calls like, say, three years from now, right? Say, three years from now. And the way I make that real in my life. So last year at this time, it was I'm becoming a woman who allows high level help. Mm. So one of my clients said to me, Frank Sinatra doesn't move pianos. And, um, I don't move pianos anymore. <laughs> and, it, and it took a year by going to my future brain, by stepping over my perfect system for not having high level help, by, um, seeing that part of me that was there all along. I was just 
unwilling to experiment and experience any of the shit that came along with it. I wanted it to be perfect. You know, I tell my clients all the time, if people who are um, researching Rett syndrome or cancer, and if they do one experiment and fail and go, oh, that didn't work. And they're like, we're all fucked. (laughs) So to be on this um, road of experiment, um, there's something I want to point out and kind of laugh with you about. Who has the butterfly on their website now, Rich? <laughs> you know, I saw that the other day and I was like, I've, why is that there? I didn't put that out there. I don't know who put that out there. <laughs> it's very funny. It's very Do funny. you remember how you, that was your first experience of me? Is like, who is this lady in butterfly wings on her website? That's actually very funny. So context for this, if you're listening, is yeah, when I first met Allison. Uh, and she reached out. I thought, oh, Alice is not one of my people. She had herself in butterfly wings on her website. Mm-hmm. And uh, what I've loved about Alison over the years is in in some ways, she's not my people, which is what I love. Because there is, there's no people over here. Um, I love that you think differently. That's what we have in common. Mm-hmm. I love that you like to rock the boat, shake up the way things are normally done. That's what we have in common. Um, what's funny is there was one event I ran where someone on I, I, was it I don't know if it was you or somebody else somebody challenged me to put on these butterfly wings uh, and and on there's a photo of me on stage where uh, feeling mortified but having a laugh at my own expense and somehow someone on my team put that article <laughs> on the front page of my website so I don't know what is that I figured it probably wasn't you know you don't move pianos anymore either so you're not the one picking the picture for the website. But when I looked that up today, just to kind of see what your current um, messaging and website was and just to tap into your energy before the call, I had to get a chuckle out of that because there is not a picture of me in any butterfly costumes or even any paint. My website is very boring. It's like three colors, black, white, and yellow. (laughs) And you have the butterfly. That made me um, chuckle for sure. Well, just so you know, I've literally sketched a picture of a butterfly with a big X through it to remind me to tell the team to change that. <laughs> Look, my, but here's again, you know, making stuff up. My websites are always four or five years out of date yep. because I'm not there trying to create a perfect website. I'm there yep. trying to serve people, make a difference out in the world. Yeah. Uh, uh, 12 weeks ago, we saw that the world was shifting and I said, you know what? I, I think there's a way I can help coaches who are not my community. Let me create a Facebook group. Uh, I called it Serve, Lead, Serve. And within a few days, we had, um, I forget how many, a thousand people, I think, joined that group. And somebody wrote to me and said, Rich, wow, that's amazing. In a few days, you got a Facebook group with a thousand people in it. And I said, no, it took me 15 years right. of putting, serving people, making a difference in the world so that when I launched a Facebook group from scratch, Within a few days, I could get a thousand people in it. We've got two and a half thousand people in it now. And it's just, it's a way of me being out there and serving people. And, and that's where my energy goes rather than trying to make the perfect picture on the perfect website. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I can hear all my dogs licking. Hey, cool it with the balls. Thank you. <laughs> You got kids opening doors. I have dogs licking their balls in the middle of podcasts. We leave these things in, by the way, because we like we show what I like to call human leadership in real life. Um, this is the real life of recording podcasts. What are you so? What are you really excited about now? Um, I'm. Pausing because it's an interesting word, the word excited at this moment in time. And it feels yeah. a, little bit, a little bit hard to get in touch with that mm-hmm. um, uh, because we're, we've been under lockdown for mm-hmm. 12 weeks. We've been homeschooling kids for all that time and running a business and trying our best to uh, have a relationship that, that can work in that with no space for, for, for one another, for ourselves as a couple. Um, and and then at this moment in time, we're watching on the news, what's going on out in the world. So it's a little bit hard to get in touch with that word excitement. Um, uh, underneath it, the energy of what, what am I excited about is, is where I put my attention more and more the last few years. I've got this amazing community of people, this amazing community of coaches and leaders who think differently, who, who like to rock the boat, who, who uh, want to make a real difference in the world. That's what excites me. I love 
working with a handful of really interesting people. Uh, I was doing some thinking recently about well, what's my business about? And I realized I can sum it up in two words, fascinating people. And, and it, the word fascinating has an ambiguity in its meaning. It has more than one meaning. It, fascinating as a, a, a verb is what I'm doing every day. Fascinating people by my writing, by the videos I create, my podcast, whatever it is. I, I want to do something that will fascinate somebody, give them a way to think differently, stimulate their thinking. And at the same time, the word fascinating uh, uh, as an adjective to describe people, I love fascinating people. Is why when you said to me, would you come on my podcast? You're someone who fascinates me. It wasn't, uh, there was no hesitation. I texted you back immediately. So anything I do that allows more and more fascinating people to come into my world, uh, that's the path I'm on for the next few years. So that, that's what excites me underneath all of that. Fascinating people. I think, you know, it is a heavy time. And this is going to sound so weird, but one of the things I'm excited about is doing the heavy and boring. It's easy to be excited the, to the fun and all that other stuff, but like going through this time <laughs> and, and not necessarily fun, <laughs> but we are talking about if somebody we value learning and how did we become fascinating? Not because our lives were easy, not because they were perfect. So I think it, I, I am thinking a lot lately of like, oh, how interesting will it be to look back on this season? Um, I, that I almost see the visual of history books. Um, let me do a little speed questions for you. I don't always do these, but this one came up. So what's your current favorite coaching question? Uh, I mean, the simplest one is always, what do you want or what do you want to yeah. create? I, I, I love that yeah. the simplicity of, of that. Um, one of my favorites, because it really strikes the heart of something as soon as you hear it, is what are you tolerating? Mm-hmm. And as soon as you hear that, there's a visceral reaction usually. What am I tolerating? Eesh, there's that feeling. So I like that question too. What are you tolerating? Would you and I got asked answer? an interesting question myself the other day which I've begun to ask a lot. Um, what's the biggest risk to your business right now? And I, that really struck me and I started to ask my clients that question. I was asked it by my financial person. I had a meeting at the start of, uh, again, about 12 weeks ago. Um, we were looking into the future, wondering what's happening with finances. And I heard that question, what's the biggest risk to your business right now? My bookkeeper was at the meeting and she spoke up and she talked about, well, what if clients don't renew? And, and I said, no, that's not it. The single biggest risk to my business over the next few months is me. If I get worn out, if I get burnt out, if I get exhausted, uh, how do I take care of me? That's the most important answer for me for that question. Uh, that's a really powerful question. Uh, You're the asset. And not, you know, I, I use that phrase about Frank Sinatra. It's not that you're just a star because you don't, you don't position yourself that way, but you are an asset. I'm an asset. I'm the, I'm the creator. I had a, a client call me uh, last week and um, she had some things scheduled and with COVID had to cancel them and hasn't been able to reschedule. And one of these people no longer needs her service. And so she was like, they want a refund. What do I do? And we had a long conversation about that. Um, I don't know how I got to you're the asset to having... I really have no idea. I'm going to have to blame it on perimenopause brain to this, you know, talking to this woman about being Nordstrom's. It's not about wrestling for the $900. Um, I have no idea how I got there. I lost my connection. Okay. Wait, you're, 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 oh, what's the biggest risk to your business? Thank you. That's how it was for just going, okay, the biggest risk. And I said, no matter how much you have to refund, if you spend time and money fighting for even that $900, I don't care if it's 9000 then you're not out there spending energy being able to create more. You are the asset and it's not just your talent, it's your ability to create new business. Mm. And I didn't tell her what to do. I just told her what I would have done and I, I refund. I you know, announce it out to the world, come and try out and not refund. That's not the intention, but I just am not going to fight with somebody if they're not happy. And... Sure enough, she called me later that night and she said, you're not going to believe that exactly $900 of income came in today. And as soon as I told that lady, you know, I'll refund you all your money. And that money came in without her even efforting it. And so that's what I mean by, uh, I get what you're saying. 
the biggest risk is us. Are we are we growing? Are we resting? Yeah. Are we um, paying attention? Um, my podcast. I'm not really great at naming things, but it comes from another one of my ancestors. Who, when I first left Keller Williams, you know, we were always taught more is more, 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 better is better. And he said to me, Allison, better is not be- more is not better. We were taught more is better. He said, better, more is not better, better is better. So my podcast is called The Better Life, Better Work Show. What's one tip you have for better life? Mm. Um, this one changed my life in 1997. I read Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Um, and I started taking on doing a weekly review. And at the end of each week, I would sit down and reflect on the week that just happened, what went well, what didn't, what I want to create the week ahead. I did it three weeks in a row. And then on the fourth week, I read back through the last three three weeks of entries. And I was astounded to see that I'd written three times in a row about how much crappy TV I was watching and how upset I was. And wanted. I had no idea until I read it at this moment after four weeks that I've been saying it for three weeks in a row, even though I Mm. felt it. And and that habit of doing some kind of weekly review, it's, I've done it in different ways. I've done it in years when I've spent every Saturday, I'd go to the beach for a day and reflect on things. Other times when I take five minutes, but a, a, a regular moment in my life where once a week, I look at the week that's just happened, I look at the week ahead and say, what do I want to create? That That time to take a review has changed my life. Thank you. What is one tip? For better work. Uh, make shit up. Uh, I, I hired a, a productivity coach a few years ago, uh, a young guy in his 20s. Uh, and, and I said, I don't want to be more productive. I'm already the most productive person I know. I want to be more creative. I, I, I want to... I want to create, not not produce. Uh, and so put your attention on creativity, put your attention on uh, creating rather than productivity. Thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah, let me say, I'll say some more on that. Just something just dawned on me. I, I, yeah. I went to a talk a few years ago um, uh, in an organization I'm in by a guy who's an expert on YouTube. He uh, has millions of followers on YouTube and he was sharing us some special software you can use that will strip out the keywords of your competitors' videos and you can take those keywords and somehow attach them to yours and it will basically pull over all your competitors' viewers to come and watch your YouTube videos and you'll enhance your views massively. And everyone's taking avid notes. And what I think most people missed is that when he was sharing his story, he said, for about five years, almost no one watched my video, the videos I made. Every week I made a video, no one and watched them. Uh, five views here, seven views here, one comment here, three comments here. But every time someone commented, he'd start an interaction with them and did it again and again. And over time, those interactions grew and people began to communicate with him. And over time, he ended up with all these millions of followers. It wasn't that he was doing this special keyword research back then. Uh, uh, Reed Hoffman, who was one of the founders of, uh, uh, founder of LinkedIn behind PayPal, lots of things like that. Billionaire says, if you want to do things that scale, start by doing things that don't scale. Airbnb, the, the, the founders, when it was uh, a couch in somebody's living room, would go and knock on the door and say, Hey, we saw you rented out your couch on our website. Wow. You came to see me. Yeah. We came to see you. How's it going? What made you do this? When you want to do things that scale, start by doing things that don't scale. Uh, when you want to have a business that's going to be successful, start by doing things that, that don't make sense from a business point of view. Interact with people, serve people, and mm-hmm. and, and all sorts of things happen from that. So so uh, the principle that I'm always pointing to is a little snail sitting sit on my bookshelf behind me to remind me, slow down to speed up. That's the one principle behind everything, business, life, that has made the biggest difference to me. I think that's one of the things... Um Right before I met you, I had recently probably drawn a fairy taking a nap. <laughs> um, naps are a, a profitable business practice of mine. And yet I tend to want to run fast. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
And so when I heard you say speed up to slow down, it really resonated with me. And then I, four or five years ago, um, fellow 4PC member, Christina Berkeley posted a video of being in a conference with, you know, it wasn't, our, it wasn't one of your conferences, but where she had done this slow tango. And I saw that video and it went through my whole body. Um, and slow tango is one of my words of the year this year. It's, it's like you, it's, it's, it's not just a yearly word. It is, it's become a thing in my life. I still want to hustle, but I want my hustle to be like the roller skate song. Do, 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 do. And I listened to the, the song from that video. I have it on Spotify and I listen to it every single day to set the rhythm of the dance that I want to do in this world. So again, even that just, just through knowing you, I wouldn't have seen that. And slow tango has become a method. And who knew? All the things we could create by slowing down. <laughs> yeah, that's that's beautiful. Have you ever seen Al Pacino in Scent of a Woman doing the tango? Oh, I have. I haven't seen it. So, like, just hearing it is starting to bring it back. Yeah, that's that's a fantastic scene. Yeah, look, it, it's it's the, our, our fear of it is we think if we slow down, we'll end up on the couch eating Cheetos out of a bucket. Um, but for those of us like you and me, we're high performers. We're driven people. It's who we've always been. It's not slow down to do nothing. It's slow down to speed up. There'll be something that will come on the other side of it that we can't access when we're operating at 95 miles an hour, the way we always operate. Now, the trouble for us is, have you ever been in a high performance car, been in a top Mercedes, BMW? You're driving on the freeway. Mm -hmm. You could be doing 100 miles an hour. It feels like you're doing 20. You can't hear mm -hmm. it. You don't know. That's how we are in day-to-day -day life. So we can't tell. We're just operating at that smooth, slow speed, except we're racing past everyone. We can't feel it. Mm -hmm. So it's slowing down. It really makes a difference. You know, I, I drove um, a Lamborghini uh, a few years ago uh, uh, on a racetrack. And they said, before you get in the car, we need to teach you how to drive a high-performance car like this. They said, slow down to go smooth. Go smooth to go fast. Mm. So literally to drive one of the fastest cars on the planet, they told you, slow down to speed up. <laughs> it makes perfect sense now. Like I, fi I finally get it and I'm still getting it. Um, there's a piece about performance in there too. And I, I have watched I make up in my mind that I've watched you make this shift and I know I've made this shift um, before your dad died. And I know that you have shared publicly and with me that, you know, you just always wanted to do a good job so your dad would be proud of you. And um, I know that I always, I didn't have any one specific purpose, purpose, but a lot of that high performance initially came to prove myself to other people. And in slowing down, like you said a while ago, sometimes we're afraid that we're just <laughs> going to be a couch potato and do nothing. Going through that discomfort, what goes away is performance. So this goes back to the uh, talking about race in our, our platforms. Because if we're talking about anti-racism on our platform and it's performative instead of intrinsic, and I, what I see you doing too, not that you weren't then, but even more now, you're creating from an intrinsic place, not from the performance place. And um, it is easier to slow down and be more sustainable financially, emotionally. I, you know, I talk about um, not just a, a financial profit and loss, but emotional health, spiritual because what good we all know people who have plenty of in the green in their PL, but their emotional PL is shit. Um and and again, I'm just gonna say you letting me be a hero in 4PC and in your world, whether it was on front of the stage or just as a friend or a client or in the back of the room, gave me practice in this exact same thing that we're talking about. Um not performing, but discovering from the inside out makes it a lot more fun. The way I see it, it's those of us who are in helping professions somehow, um, mm -hmm. we have um, two oxygen tanks on our back. And one of them is the, the tank we use that gets re-energized when we help someone. 
And the other one is a tank. The, the energy gradually goes down. And if we don't do something to take care of ourselves, whilst that one can go up over time each time we help somebody, we've got another tank of energy that's being emptied gradually. And if we're not careful, not paying attention to our own energy tank, not the one we use to serve others, the other one that's just for us only, we get burnt out, we've got nothing left. So we've got to pay attention to ourselves. Uh, we've got to take care of ourselves first. It sounds trite and it's easy to miss, but it's really important. Thank you for spending time with me today and just talking in whatever circles uh, we talked in. Um, it's good to see your face. I know we text a lot, but it's good to see your face. Um, I'm, I see the time now and need to let you go and finish this up. What's um, any final words? Um, here's what comes to me. One of my team pointed out to me a couple of years ago that round about September, October, I've got into this habit of hiring some kind of business expert who I then fire about two months later. And <laughs> she told me this, so I realized, oh my God, that's true. And what happens to me around about September, October is I either think we're not going to hit our numbers this year, we're not going to be successful, I need an expert to help me, or we're doing really well. We're going to hit our numbers. Oh my God, we've got to do it all over again next year. I need an expert to help me. And the metaphor is, it's like I'm climbing this very steep mountain and ahead of me is pristine snow. So it's clear no one's ever been on this mountain before. No one's ever got to the peak of this mountain. And I keep hiring experts who say, I know how to climb mountains, but they've never been on my mountain. Mm -mm. And, and so this isn't advice for anyone else other than for myself to remember no one's ever climbed this mountain before. You've got to find your own way. You're going to slip down sometimes. You're going to make mistakes. But there's no one out there who knows better than you how to climb your mountain, how to go on your path, how to step into the steps that you need to make. And the only way you can do it is taking one tentative, afraid, scared step at a time. And that's the best I can do. And I'm doing that every day. Perfection. Now you've given me yet one more thing to pass on um, through the lineage. So thank you for being um, a friend and an ancestor to not only to me, but uh, I'm passing a lot of richness from rich down to my people and to the people listening today. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks, Allison. You're welcome. Hey, y'all. If you've been thinking about joining my amazing membership, coaching, and community program, I wanted to encourage you to hop on over to www.coachwithallison.com and get on the wait list for when we open the doors next. Right now, our doors are not open, but I do want you to be the first to know when the doors do open so that you can join our amazing community. One of the things I know that you will love about being a Soli is that for a very reasonable rate, you can get not only community uh, coaching and training, but you can have money left over in your budget to implement as a soulful CEO. So the place to sign up to get on the wait list next time soulful success opens up is www.coachwithallison.com. For most of human history, it wasn't called coaching. It was called leadership. And it's what I love to do, to coach people, to lead people, and to mess with people's thinking. If you'd like more of this, or if you'd like to learn more about our community of extraordinary top performers, go to rich.com. Litvin.com forward slash one insight.